It was after this particular action, as you can imagine, that we were then called upon by Admiral Sprague with his aircraft in the Pacific Ocean wanting assistance because they had been attacked by the, by the Japanese and were needed help from us. But Admiral Kincaid, he denied them until he had cleaned up the strait. But eventually, at the hour of 10 o'clock in the morning, we formed up what was called a strike force with battleships, cruisers and destroyers, 13 all told, and steamed up north to defend what may have been a very nasty battle against the aircraft carriers. It never occurred, and we steamed back and brought back them under our protection until we got back into Leyte Gulf. We then prepared for the next big landing, which was to be in Lingayen Gulf, of 210, maybe 220,000 Marines, and that occurred a little while later, not, not immediately, in January 1945. Before we left there, though, there were some rumours that the Americans weren't quite happy with the sort of AA guns we had on Shropshire. So our gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Bracegirdle, approached the Americans to see whether he could get a hold of some Bofors machine guns. Our gunnery officer went over with a dozen bottles of whisky to some bloke he found out who controlled the equipment in the American Army and he came back with 14 machine guns. The Americans, on top of giving us the 14 Bofors, they sent their men over to the weld them on our decks to make them very efficient and an added firepower for our ship. Because when we end, left, finally left Leyte Gulf, steamed up into the South China Sea on the western side of, of the Philippines, towards uh, Lingayen Gulf. The weather was rough, it was pretty bad. The ships were looking like submarines half the time on the huge waves. They were so submerged, all you saw was their superstructure. They go through this bloody big wave and the whole ship would be covered. We were going through these 30, 40 foot bloody waves and they were massive. And we had 30 feet freeboard right up the front end. It was Amazing, the waves. No one was allowed on the upper deck. One of the guns we put on the bow of Shropshire was a bofa. All we had on board to shield it from the blast from the eight inch was some quarter plate steel. So they built a shield around the back of the gun so the fellas could get some protection from the blast. After several times going through some big waves, if one came along, it took the shield, buckled the gun in on, on its emplacement, and that was the end of the uh, number one bofa on board the Shropshire. And how the hell some of those poor soldiers put up on that damn barges, and it wouldn't matter what barge you're in, big or small, you're going to be tossed around. Then everything settled down, and we got into our first attack by kamikazes. The kamikazes attacked ferociously nearly all the ships. And the most scariest times of my life was when the kamikazes were attacking and uh, one came in on the Shropshire from the port side, low over the water, how it missed B turret when its wing dipped between the stern of the, weir, of the turret and the bridge and didn't chop my head off, I don't know. But all I know, I was standing there the captain said, clear the bridge. I hadn't heard him. I looked around, there wasn't a bloke inside. I'm the only bloke on the, on the bridge. I'll tell you today, I can still see the pilot with a white band around his head. I can still see the plane coming at this monstrous speed at about three or 400 miles an hour. And suddenly it went past me. I thought I'm dead and I dropped down in absolute fear, of course. I hide behind the bulkhead and it splashed in the sea with petrol going everywhere and voices calling out, out cigarettes. The next thing, the gunnery officer came up and shook me, all right, Nichols? Yes, sir. Well, get up, which I did, got on my job again. And that was one of those moments I didn't even know what really happened. I'm dressed up in full battle dress and what had happened, I'd piddle myself. It had run down my leg into my shoe. It was all nice and squelchy. 
And honestly, this, I didn't notice until suddenly the smell came up and hit me. Thank God it was only Piddle and not the other. I thought I'd done the dastardly thing. So that was one of those moments I've never forgotten. I thought that was the end. And this is where the HMAS Australia was hit by a plane. And as the commander's runner at the time, he said to me, watch that plane, Nichols. So I reported to him what occurred in those few minutes. And the plane, we shot down from our starboard side guns and it hit the water. The pilot was absolutely a magnificent pilot. He bounced off the water and considered it low level around behind the Australia, came up on its port side, hit the funnel, hit the bridge, petrol all over the place. Many men were burnt and killed and many wounded during this action. That was one of those little scenes that nobody really wanted to see. The HMAS Australia got hit by, by five kamikazes which put her out of action, in fact, for the rest of the war. She had her funnels done and uh, all her AA gun was put out of action, all her four inch were finished. So she didn't see any more action after that year in 1945. Well, all the time the planes, I must have, we did shoot down quite a few. Port side, the plane came in and everything opened up. But in the end, it was the eight barrel pom poms and blew it out of the, out of the sky. The pilot had jumped out, believe it or not. And as he's floating down, the voice came from them somewhere on the ship behind the bridge. I think it was a signalman actually. Shoot the bastard. Well, that wasn't our style. However, the Japanese bloke released him from his parachute, plummeted down about 300 feet to his death. That was one, I did witness the whole shooting match. The second attack came, there was a ship about, I suppose a quarter of a mile away from us on our starboard side, and there's one Japanese fighter, we assumed it was a kamikaze, he was being followed by an American fighter, and the Yank was really giving him curry. But what happened? They both ran in to our pom-pom shells and our, and our uh, bofers. They both got shot down. The captain was so worried if he'd ploughed up and shattered his aircraft for him, he followed it up, and all he got was a broken hip. Oh, there's one other I'd like to mention, my brother on the Gascoigne, the ATMAS Gascoigne. He was the first lieutenant, in other words, second in charge of the Gascoigne. Captain's on the bridge, he's down aft in case the bridge is wiped out. And they shot down a plane that's exploded. Most of the bits, apart from the main body, landed on the Shropshire. What he didn't know, of course, that his young brother was uh, right down the aft of the ship and could have got hit by a bit of that stuff. I should have told him, you know. I never told him what he, he could have told me. But suddenly we'd gone through the kamikaze attacks on the way up. We dished them up properly, the whole fleet. After we'd done the landing and dropped 220,000 more Marines, in the Lingayen Gulf of the Philippines from our second big operation. An American offered to take a photograph of the whole ship's company of Shropshire. And you wouldn't believe it, at a low speed of five knots, because we were out of danger in the Gulf, they lined up well over a thousand of our men on the forecastle. I suppose there were at least a hundred or so blokes were not there out of the 1,280 men comprised the ship's company. And this American cameraman came over, stood on top of the two rails right up on the forecastle, and must have taken several photographs, but he took a magnificent photograph of all the men. We were rather excited that for once in our lives, we were going to operate with Australian troops. For the last two years, virtually, we've been operating with the American 7th Fleet and with the American Marines. But at last, the Australians were giving a job of eliminating the Japanese on, on two places at Borneo. One at Balakpapan and the other one at Labuan. After we completed the bombardments there, the Japanese were eliminated 
and we were then to go up to a place called Formosa, which is now called Taiwan, and that was to be our next target before we hit Japan. And we were sitting up in a place called Subic Bay, waiting for the order to go north. They'd say before you're coming into harbour, the beer issue, they get it all out on the upper deck, and chill it down, that's what they call it, chilling it down with the wind by pouring salt water on it. It was bloody vile, warm, horrible beer. However, at the end of the war when I drank my beer and the celebration of the bomb, I'd got six bottles. And I went to John Shearing, an engineer officer, who was a friend of my brother's, and got him to swap me six co two cold bottles for my warm bottles. And they're the ones I was drinking up there alongside of the turret the day I was celebrating the, the finish of the Japanese Empire. A decent cold beer. It was a pleasure to drink a whole bottle down straight. It was bloody good. We were hot. It was all over. Really good. I suppose one of the best experiences that we really enjoyed, all of us, we entered Tokyo Bay in amongst 258 warships. Gordon Urquhart, as I've mentioned before, he and I decided to visit the Diet, D-I-E-T. It's the Japanese name for their parliament. And because Dad was Speaker of the House in South Australia and a member for 41 years, I knew he might be interested if I can get him a souvenir. So we tried to get in through the doors to get on the floor of the house and that was just plain impossible. Jack and I hunted around and we reckoned we could get up on top and have a look inside the dead, which we did. We found a staircase, hidden of course. So we climbed up there and we dropped down right onto the floor of the dead. So in the meantime, we suddenly got a sudden urge to go to the toilet. And there was another shock to our system. Their toilets had two indentations for foot rests in the floor, a round hole, about six inches diameter, so you had to be deadly accurate, and you had a hanging rail on the back of the door. You hung onto that, and you kept the door closed. That was a Japanese toilet. Well, we both had to do it, so we did our business. So while I'm there, the doors of the toilets had brass knobs, the glass, cut glass pattern in them, very attractive. And I unscrewed the doorknob and I thought my dad would like to know this came from the diet. And suddenly the guard appeared. But he didn't really know what to do himself, but we were sailors and we were foreign. So he sort of suggested ushered us out the door. So we went out, pleasure. I took this doorknob home to Adelaide, not once did I ever tell you to Dad it was off the dunny door. I think that would have gone down like a lead balloon because he never used it. He had it in his desk for a while. So that's what happened to the dunny door knob off one of the dear dunnies. We were within about a half a mile in Toki Bay from, from the Missouri and that was for the signing of the peace. But unfortunately, there's a limitation of what the Missouri could take on from 258 warships. How many fellows were allowed to come on board to be on the forecastle starboard side alongside the two main gun turrets where they set up the table for the signing of the peace. They allocated one to Shropshire. That was the Commodore, Commodore Collins took that one. It was a dull day, a drizzly day. And suddenly out, right at the time of the signing of the peace, the sun shone. 1,000 planes went over the top. They just appeared over the top. And uh, it was magnificent. You've got to give the Yanks their due. If nothing else happens, they put on a great show. They really did. So then the signing of the peace went through till finally after 80 days and sitting in Tokyo Bay with the ship getting colder and a bit of snow falling down in November forming a slurry all over the upper deck 
we left Tokyo Bay. We had four deaths on board the ship. Not in action, but on, on duty. Doesn't no matter where they are, if they're attached to the ship, they're on duty. So they're all designated as part of the crew. They were the only four that met their demise serving in the Shropshire. They were just plain lucky ship. So then we cruised down to through Guadalcanal again, back to New Guinea, pulled into a place called Weeback. And that was the best day of our life. We picked up just over, I think it was 647, I think it was, Australian troops from Weeback. Well, suddenly we're on a ship of 1,280. We've got 640 extra blokes. There was no control. No matter what they tried, so they just let her go. And then we steamed south, and most of the soldiers thought, this is great, until we went to sea, the open sea, doing 12 knots, conserving fuel, by the way. And the ship rolled like a bastard. You've never seen so many fellas hanging over the side, wanting to die. No one had any sympathy for them, because they'd given us a rough time that it happened. Guys, you fellas have got it easy. That's what they say. <laughs> so then we lobbed into Sydney. Well, Sydney was a, a place and a half, really. The first thing I went ashore at Circular Quay, straight to ship in and drink beer. Down the side lane was a hamburger joint. You'd bring your beer out onto the footpath, sit in the, with your feet in the gutter, plate full of prawns or hamburgers, and away you went. But if you ever left the bar of the ship in, you didn't get back in again. You had to have one hand on the bar. But at six deep, you just didn't move. You just hand the beer back to your friends. Drinking one while they're doing it, of course. The ship was going back to be in the victory tour for the big march through London. And of course, because there'd been one hell of a row about the HMAS Australia when she ceased activity in January 1945 and did her victory cruise, they took off most of the crew who served in it and put up with all the shenanigans, the attacks on it, the fires and the death of men. And uh, there was one ruckus row about it because suddenly two thirds of the crew were new chums who had not served in the Australia. Well, they weren't going to let that happen to the Shropshire. So they had to ask everybody, would you be interested? And I was asked by Lieutenant Osborne, who was my divisional officer, would I care to sign on for two more years because you can have the victory cruise and on the parade in London, to which I said with no hesitation, no sir, I'm not interested in signing on for two more years in the Navy to go to London to be there at the parade. So that was it. But in the end, it proved right because when they got over there for the big parade, have a guess how many were really going on the on the march. Eight. In the end, one bloke was sick. He stayed in his bunk in the tent in Hyde Park, London, and seven marched to Shropshire. Well, she remained in service for about another two years. They appointed a junior captain who'd come up from a, a destroyer captaincy. He took a lot of training ships out, the new recruits and the cadets in the Naval College. And then they put her in reserve over there in Athol Bay, right across from the big Sydney Yacht Club. And she stayed there till 1954, where she was towed in 1954 to be scrapped in England by the uh, Dutch tug Utzi, U-T-Z-E. He towed her back to the England and they scrapped her. So that was the end of me, as far as that's concerned. I then reported to the place that I enlisted in, HMAS Torrens, the depot I applied to join. And I spent a couple of weeks there. And my cousin, who was also in the Navy, Jim Nichols, he uh, said to me, grab the telephonist job. It's a real lurk. Because you're on four hours or eight hours, but he said, if you play it cool, you can stay on 
for 12 hours straight to get a couple of days off. You had to stay awake, of course. You didn't tell the officers that, but you did it. So I took on being a telephonist until I was discharged on my appointed hour and I came home. No big march for Stan Nichols or the other five incumbents with me. There were six of us. We didn't even know one another. We never served together. We went to the Red Lion pub in Rundle Street, Adelaide. We had six schooners of beer each. Said, toodaloo, shoot through, farewell. Nice to know you. And that was it. I walked out on the footpath. And that was the end of my time in the Navy. So I went home to mum and dad. Stepped in a good bed. Nancy, I said to her at one stage about a year before, that if I volunteer, I have to remember, and you'll have to remember that she should go out like I will go out while I'm in the Navy, because after all, we can't just sit home at our age and not see people or get involved with people at dances and any other celebration that's going on. And uh, she sort of agreed to that. There's not much you could do about it, really. And I, I didn't really see a hell of a lot of Nancy during my service. I came home on two leaves. I only saw her one once. I only wrote uh, two letters the whole time I was in the Navy. One to Mum and Dad, one to Nancy. Oh, yes, every letter you wrote had to go to the officer. A lot of mine got home with cutouts everywhere. I, uh, I mentioned one of the battles we were in, and I mentioned it, I suppose, about 10 ships to Dad, and then cut each one name out in case someone picked up the letter. There's a lot of bullshit, but still they were right, really. No one told me, I wonder I didn't get a blast for writing it in the first place. But that was the rule. You had to write stupid letters over. You weren't even allowed to mention the weather. And Nancy's never forgotten the first day when I got home when I rang up and I said to her, you're going out with some bloke. Turns out it was some fellow that I was at school with it was hanging around like a bad smell. At any rate, so she was pleased to give him what you might call the giant flick. And we're on again. So within a very short time, we became engaged. We got married just before I turned 21. That was in... Uh, February the 14th, and Nancy turned 21 on the 1st of April, I turned 21 on the 1st of June. Oh yes, settling down after the war was a little difficult for me. I, I said in another one of my talks that I really, I, I felt lost. I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I saw the Harry Wesley Smith, he was my university father. I was talked to him and I was granted one year in engineering, which I did and failed. He then gave me another go because he was very interested in people who'd seen a lot of action. So he said, I think you should maybe try science. Well, I hadn't quite completed the science year and I still hadn't studied. I still hadn't worked. It was bloody hopeless. I, re I packed it in and left. About November of that year, I didn't sit for the exam, so I can't say I failed, but I, I would have failed. So after I did that, I then decided to get a job under my own steam. And I applied a job with uh, J.C. Benbow, who made automotive spare parts. I stayed there for a year. Well, I left there, then worked for uh, a factory that made hospital equipment. This appealed to me, yeah, this looked good. Another fellow and myself, the Vice Chancellor of the Adelaide Juni, his son was also ex-Navy. We decided together we'd start up a factory. He was going to learn about electric welding because in all hospital equipment, electroplating is vital. Well, it didn't work out. I'd put a bit of steel through my hands, squashed two fingers and an arc weld splash in my left eye. So that finished that when Mum suggested, I think you better get a job behind the desk. So which I did, 
any rate, I then joined, not knowing it, but the, the Department of Labor and National Service. And I discovered they had a big segment there called the CES, Commonwealth Employment Service. So I asked for a transfer, and that's where my career started, of interviewing people every day, all day. And I must admit, I was bloody good at it. So that remained until I retired in 1956. I joined the RSL club in 46. I attended quite a few meetings, but in the end I, I got a little tired of that because the first World War blokes had a habit of getting into your ear of what it was like in the trenches. But after you've had a few nights of that and you've sucked off a few grogs, I did lose a bit of interest. I also joined the Naval Association and uh, I led the march for 10 years as president of the club. I was invited to various clubs to talk on the Shropshire because they'd heard about my prowess at telling the yarn. And then I started to give slideshows. So I wrote off to the Naval Historical Society of Australia, which I, am, I was a member of, I may say. Uh, when are you going to write the story of Shropshire's battle tours and the rest of her career with the Australian Navy. The answer was, you'll be last on the ship because there are dozens of other ships we'd have to write the story on before we got Shropshire. Because we've had the other ships for five or six years and the Shropshire only three. So then I wrote to them and volunteered I would write the book. I would like all the information from them that I can get and I proceeded to hunt information. Because one thing I do really reiterate to sailors, when we talk about what did you do, I was never really interested in what they did. What did the ship do? Because that's all we should really talk about. What did the ship do? And a lot of fellas would come up to you, say, write this down, Stan. They sent me all their pictures. If nothing else they did, they certainly didn't write anything down. They sent me all their pictures. 10,000 photographs, and I photographed the whole lot. And I started on the writing, which I did for six years, and wrote the history of HMA Shropshire. I felt tickled pink with the whole story that I had written, and I might say so, I wrote, I reckon, a pretty good book. And if you've ever read the damn thing, it uh, does tell you a fair bit about the ship, the way we started, how we got it, and what happened in the end. Well, just, just one major point of interest to all the people who one day will listen to what I've got to say. If they want to read what's happened about the whole story of Shropshire, I suggest they get under the internet, where they can read every single word and look at every single photograph, of which there are 300 odd photographs throughout the book, which should keep your interest, as far as I'm concerned, in what the ship did throughout its three years with the Australian Navy. I'd like to make a special mention of my daughter, Judith Milroy, early. She did all the typing of the book, and after many discussions, changing the awful spelling that I had written a thousand pages and over the 300 pictures where to put them, we finally got the book right. And I've discovered since then I've only seen two errors in the book. So it was an excellent job done my daughter and I even pat myself on the back as a fair go. So thank you Judith. I'd like to mention my son Robert Broughton Nichols who a lot of people in Queensland might remember as the, one of the bosses in the Credit Union of Australia. He'd been most helpful in organising to get these films made so they can be kept in the memory of our children and any friends who may be interested in watching it. Understandably, I think you'll find them on the internet to view at your will. So thanks, Rob Nichols. You've been a great son. I suppose, last but not least, is a thank you to my wife for putting up 
with my Navy jargon and the crap that went on all over the last few years, not only up here in Queensland, but what happened, happened in South Australia when I was putting the book together to, to make sure that people knew all about the Shropshire and what a great ship she was. Thank you, Nancy.